It appears that some of you are not taking the urgent threat of climate change seriously enough, which is why the President of the United States wants to remind you just how serious it really is. You know, I've seen firsthand what the reports make clear, the devastating toll of climate change and its existential threat to all of us and is the ultimate threat to humanity, climate change. The ultimate threat. I'm not sure if President Biden really believes this. I'm not sure if Biden really believes anything. But plenty of people really do believe this. Because we live in an increasingly pagan age. And what pagans fear and worship, ultimately, is nature. That is why the old pagans, the old-timey pagans, would sacrifice goats and babies and things to make it rain. They considered the ultimate threat to mankind to be material, chiefly climate change. That was true for all of history until the advent and spread of Christianity, which crucially considers the ultimate threat to humanity to be immaterial, chiefly sin. So we stopped living in servile fear of the weather gods for about 1,700 years. And now we're at it again. Here comes the new boss, same as the old boss. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. Nikki Haley is in hot water for a proposal that she had on social media reform that a lot of conservatives are saying is very lib. Uh, We will get to that in a moment because it's actually a pretty interesting proposal. Ultimately, probably not the greatest idea, but we'll get to it in just a moment. First, though, on this point of religious confusion, Raphael Warnock, who is a socialist senator from Georgia who fancies himself a pastor of some sort or other, uh, he just attacked evangelical Protestants for supporting Donald Trump. Here is his argument, or lack thereof. Does it bother you that the evangelical community seems to be, continue to very much be behind Donald Trump? Is that surprising? It's a deep contradiction. Mm-hmm. It's a deep contradiction. And um, I think that... Um, when the history of this period is written, um, we, we will have a lot to say about about that. Um, you cannot account for <laughs> some of the divisive forces at work in our country, mm-hmm. sadly, without reference to what's happening in huge segment, segments of the American church. Um, I come out of a tradition that has always tried to use our faith to bring us together. Um, I like the way Jimmy Carter used his faith. Mm -hmm. I like the way Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Ella Baker Mm. and Mm. and, uh, white brothers and sisters like James Reeb um, uh, in the midst of the civil rights movement, how they use their faith. There's actually a lot there. Even though Warnock begins, and it sounds like he's got nothing, he says, you know, it's really bad, these evangelicals supporting Trump, you know. It's really bad. And someday people are going to explain why it's bad. I'm not going to explain it now because I don't know because I can't say anything about it. Because I don't have an argument. But someday, trust me, someday, later later on people are going to talk about why it's so bad that these evangelicals keep supporting Trump instead of socialists like me. But then he almost hints at an argument. He, He shows his cards on his error with regard to Christianity. And his error, it boils down to that one word, use. He said, you know, man, I like how all these other left-wing people used their faith. Used their faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Faith now has become a substitute word for religion. And what is religion? Religion is a, a habit of virtue that inclines the will to give God what he deserves. It's not something you use. It's not something in service of another thing. It's giving to God what he deserves. That's what it is. Faith is a theological virtue. And religion is giving to God what he deserves. But for the libs, it's just a, another thing to be used. 
used in service of what? Well, Raphael Warnock makes it clear. Religion is just something to be used in service of political change. Change on this earth. Social engineering. Which is really ironic, because that's what the libs always accuse the conservative Christians of doing. They say, you just use your religion in service of your right-wing ends. But I don't think that's fair at all. I don't think that's true. And in fact, I think, like so many other left-wing attacks on conservatives, it's just projection. And here you have Raphael Warnock admitting it himself. He says, yeah, I just, I just want to use my faith in service of politics. Here, I'll, let me tell you about my great faith idols, my, the people that I admire. In, in this case, idolatry probably being used uh, precisely. But these are, the, these are the people that I look up to when it comes to religion. And he names some names that I've never heard of. He says Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King had many admirable qualities. But Martin Luther King denied really central aspects of the Christian faith. He denied the divinity of Christ. He denied the miracles, okay? He denied, he, he denied really essential aspects of Christianity. So you might say he was a great social reformer. You might say he was a great political activist, a political leader, but he was far from an Orthodox Christian. But for Warnock, that's fine. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, ultimately what your faith consists of and where your hope ultimately lies because all religion is, is just a, a way to affect politics. That's what it's about. We just got to use it. And, and for, for Warnock, even further, you, this is so telling. He says, the reason that these evangelicals who support Trump are bad is because they're divisive. They want to just divide people. And I like people like Jimmy Carter who use their religion to bring people together. What does our Lord tell us? If, you, if you've read the Gospels, if you've been to church more than a few times, you might have heard that Christ says, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. I come ultimately, yes, to unite people with me and my Father who are one in heaven, but not to just have everybody kumbaya on earth. Our, our Lord did not come to build the Tower of Babel. So no, I, I, I will divide children from their parents, okay? I, will, I, I bring a sword. I bring division in a worldly sense. And I bring that unity in a heavenly sense, in an ultimate sense. And for libs like Raphael Warnock, it's completely the opposite. For libs like Raphael Warnock, it's all just about holding hands and building the Tower of Babel here on earth because we're not looking at ultimate ends. We're not looking, it's just like what Joe Biden's talking about with the, the ultimate threat to humanity being the weather. No, the ultimate threat to humanity, Christianity tells us, is not anything here on earth. It's not a bullet. It's not the weather. It's not a disease. It, the ultimate threat is your soul. Who cares if you can win the whole world, but you lose your soul? The soul is going to persist a lot longer. When we talk about the soul, we talk about eternity. When we talk about just fleshy things, that will pass away, ultimately. It is, uh, Raphael Warnock has no idea that he's conveying all of these things, but, but it's, a, it's a pregnant answer to the question from Jen Psaki. And it's a, it's a reminder that the, ultimately the leftist religion is worldliness. Now, I mentioned, ultimately, you don't need to fear bullets. But, you know, on earth, if you want to preserve your body and live a little while longer, it's probably a good idea to be cautious of them, which is why you ought to check out Bulletproof Everyone. Right now, go to BulletproofEveryone.com. Use code Knowles. Bulletproof Everyone is revolutionizing everyday safety with their exclusive line of bulletproof clothing. Imagine your favorite jacket, your favorite hoodie with added bulletproof protection. That is what Bulletproof Everyone offers, everyday clothing with an extraordinary twist. These clothes are designed to look and feel just like your usual wardrobe items, but with a hidden layer of safety. The ultimate blend of fashion and function. You can say goodbye to the bulkiness of regular soft armor. It is so lightweight and comfortable, you will forget that you are wearing anything at all. Despite how thin and light they are, these clothes provide a robust defense against various threats with their 3A option capable of stopping up to a 44 Magnum. That is their top-tier protection in a sleek package. Best part? They're as easy to care for as your regular clothes. Wear, wash, repeat, no special handling required. They even offer free tailoring with every single order. Bulletproof Everyone sent us a custom jacket and check this out. This is not only one of the backpacks that they sent me. This is the same backpack that you will get for free with any purchase of clothing. I travel a lot, so it's nice to have peace of mind 
that I'm always protected. Stay protected without sacrificing style or comfort. Bulletproof Everyone is not just changing clothing, they're changing the game in personal safety. Right now, our listeners can get 10% off plus a free Bulletproof backpack with the purchase of any Bulletproof clothing. Just use code Knowles at checkout at BulletproofEveryone.com. BulletproofEveryone.com, promo code Knowles. Speaking of secular liberal culture, really sad story. I meant to get to it a couple days ago. Uh, you know about the little British girl, Indy Gregory. She was a baby who had a disease, and uh, the UK government said, we don't want to pay for her medical treatment anymore, so we're going to kill her. And I had her father, Dean Gregory, come on the show. He was making a last-minute appeal to the courts. Sadly, the courts shot it down. The Italian government gave Indy Gregory citizenship, so the UK government ultimately ended up killing an Italian citizen, which creates an international legal crisis that will probably just be brushed aside, but it, it seems significant to me. Uh, the Vatican offered to treat baby Indy Gregory at the Bambino Jesu Hospital, but the UK was so embarrassed by this. The UK couldn't allow the baby to go seek treatment elsewhere because that would be an indictment on the UK. It would be, it would be a global embarrassment that some other government has to step in to save a British citizen because the British government just wants to kill that citizen to save a few bucks, even a, a little innocent baby like Indy Gregory. Now, we knew this was the way the story was almost certain to end from the very beginning, and that is what happened. But there, there was one happy little turn before the story, before Indy Gregory's earthly story ended, which is that a Mr. Gregory, the father, had the baby baptized. And it's not as though Dean Gregory was some devout, practicing Christian. He has not been that. In fact, that's what makes the story even more powerful. Dean Gregory says, I'm not a religious guy. But, but, he says, quote, When I was in court, I felt as if hell pulled at me. I thought that if hell exists, then heaven must exist too. I thought that if the devil exists then God must exist too. I have seen what hell is like, and I want Indy to go to heaven. Show me the flaw with that argument. That's a beautiful, beautiful argument. That's great. Some people won't like this argument because they'll say, well, you know, no, that's, you're, you're not making a perfectly rational argument for the existence of God and for the historicity of the Gospels and for the, this, and it's not neat and pat. And to, no, this is a great, this is a great argument. This is a much, much realer argument, frankly, because he's saying, you know, yeah, I'm not religious at all. And I, I, I can't recite to you Thomas Aquinas's five ways for knowing the existence of God. But I'll tell you what, when I was in that British courtroom and that, that evil judge was killing my daughter, I knew what evil was. I knew that evil exists. I knew that evil has a personality. I could feel a rather serious simulacrum of hell. And with all the devil's machinations in that courtroom, he undid himself. With all the devil's machinations, he undermined himself because it occurred to me that if the devil exists and if hell exists, well, then God in heaven must exist too. And God in heaven must be much greater than the devil in hell. And so he had his baby baptized. I, to this, I don't know what he currently thinks about all these things, but he knew enough to say, I am going to do what I can to save my daughter. E even the fact that he had to confront something that most of us can push off, which is the fact of mortality. We're all going to end up in the same place as Indy Gregory. Most of us don't end up there at eight months old, but, but we're all going to end up there at some point. And so... It, you know, the silver lining in that storm cloud, which is, which is a storm cloud that we're all going to face, which is the fact of a fallen world and our own mortality. He was able to find that silver lining there, which is the confrontation of death. It's, it's why, uh, why uh, Dr. Johnson had a famous line, which is, depend upon it, sir, when a man knows he's to be hanged in, the, in a fortnight, it concentrates the mind wonderfully. Say, so when, we, when we actually have to face the thing that we put off as best we can for our entire lives, namely the fact of our death, our inevitable death, it concentrates us. And it, it doesn't confuse us. What the atheists and the liberals want us to believe is, well, it just has us desperately grasping at straws and wish casting this notion that we can live forever. But it's really the opposite. It, it has us focus and say, okay, well, what is the meaning of my life? What am I? Am I just a bag of chemicals or am I something more than that? Do my natural desires and longings for something beyond this world point to something that does exist beyond this world? D does my natural intuition and deduction of the metaphysical, the fact that 
we know we know for certain there are things that are not merely physical in this world, like, I don't know, mathematics. The fact that there are metaphysical things, does that imply something more about metaphysical reality? And all of that hit Mr. Gregory like a ton of bricks in that courtroom. And the, the, the personification of evil that he saw occurring around him and to him, and therefore the personification of good. Ultimately, ultimately a happy ending albeit with much pain in the meantime. Now, speaking of this, speaking of politically motivated conversions, I teased a story a few days ago that I I do want to get to at least briefly. Ayan Hirsi Ali, very prominent political figure. She was raised Muslim. She recoiled against that. She became an atheist and a big anti-Islam and Islamism campaigner. And she was a, a very popular figure in the West and remains a popular figure in the West. She's converted to Christianity, and she's done it in a way that some Christians don't like. She has converted politically. She has converted sort of the way that Indy Gregory was converted through her father, which is politically, as a result of political events. Though, though for Ayan Hirsi Ali, it's even, it's even more political in that she says, the reason that I'm a Christian is because civilization cannot withstand barbarism without Christianity. So she is, she is describing Christianity in a kind of instrumental way. She says, why do I call myself Christian now? Part of the answer is global. Western civilization is under threat from three different related forces. The resurgence of great power authoritarianism and expansionism in the forms of the Chinese Communist Party and Putin's Russia. The rise of global Islamism, political Islam, which threatens to mobilize a vast population against the West, and the viral spread of woke ideology, which is eating into the moral fiber of the next generation. She says, we endeavor to fend off these threats with modern secular tools, military, economic, diplomatic, and technological efforts to defeat, bribe, persuade, appease, or surveil. And yet, with every round of conflict, we find ourselves losing ground. We're either running out of money with our national debt in the tens of trillions, or we're losing our lead in the tech race with China. We can't fight off these formidable forces unless we can answer the question, what is it that unites us? The response that God is dead, which Nietzsche gives, is insufficient. So too does the attempt to find solace in the rules-based international liberal order, which is just a bunch of gobbledygook words that have not uh, done very much for us recently. The only credible answer, says Ayan Hirsi Ali, lies in our desire to uphold the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. That is why I no longer consider myself a Muslim apostate, but a lapsed atheist. Of course, I still have a great deal to learn about Christianity. I discover a little more at church each Sunday, but I have recognized in my own long journey through a wildness, wilderness rather, of fear and self-doubt that there is a better way to manage the challenges of existence than either Islam or unbelief had to offer. And and so there are going to be Christians who criticize Ali and say, well, you you shouldn't, in the same way that I just criticized Raphael Warnock, you shouldn't just use Christianity as some instrument toward a political end. But whereas for Raphael Warnock, that appears to be the, the end of his faith journey. Well, for Raphael Warnock, this is something that he has considered for decades, working as a professional Christian he says, no, this is what Christianity is about. Actually recoiling against people whose faith points to something higher than politics. For Ayan Hirsi Ali, this is only the beginning. And she is admitting this here in the column. She's saying, I have a lot to learn. I'm learning a little bit more every time I go to church, every time I read something. And so I'm learning. But what, what she's saying is the political is what pulled me into Christianity. Not that I am a Christian instrumentally so that I can achieve certain political ends. She's saying the political problem is what first turned me on to the fact that that all of these other solutions don't work. And maybe that's that's why Christianity has something to recommend it. Maybe Christianity even possibly is true. That's fine by me. We live in a very modern, liberal, individualist age. And modern, certainly a number of strains of modern Protestantism, not all, but but a number of them, are highly individualistic and highly emotivist. And they'll say, well, you just need to be feeling certain things individually. Forget about the church. Forget about the community. Forget about the reality of sacraments. Just You got to just feel stuff, man, going on inside of you. And if you don't feel it, your faith is not real. That is not historically what Christians have believed. In fact, there have been whole communities and whole nations that have converted en masse 
the political has often led conversion to the faith. For goodness sakes, Armenia is the oldest Christian country in the world. The country converted in, what was it, 301 or 310? It was before the Edict of Milan legalized Christianity, relaxed the, the prohibitions on Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. That was, a, that was a conversion. A number of the tribes that took over the Roman Empire after the fall of the empire converted en masse. Nations used to be called Christian nations. Our civilization used to be a Christian civilization. The, the political order does not necessarily have to be totally opposed to Christianity. There does not necessarily have to be a firm separation of church and state. In fact, there never has been for all of history anywhere in the world. Not in this country, not in any other country. The question is merely what religion is animating your country and your civilization. Right now, in, in modern liberal culture, we've returned to worshiping the nature gods, just as they did before the advent of Christianity. And we say the ultimate threat is that it won't rain this season, so we have to make a few more sacrifices and do a little more of a rain dance, put on our, our big rituals where we go march around and dance and listen to a, a Swedish child yell at us. And if we do that for long enough, then the nature gods will, will smile and, and show their favor to us and we'll get rain for the harvest. That's the, that's the new religious ritual that animates our civilization. It's a ridiculous one. It's not going to be conducive to, to flourishing personally or politically. Or we could go back to the one that served us very well for at least 1,700 years. That's the one that Ion Hersey Alley is, is realizing might serve us well again. Now, when you want to serve your dog and improve your dog's health, you got to check out Rough Greens. Right now, go to roughgreens.com slash Michael. The holidays are coming up fast. While you're out shopping for your kids, family, and friends, don't forget to shop for your pets too. Give your dog the gift of a healthier and happier life with... Rough Greens. Naturopathic Dr. Dennis Black, the founder of Rough Greens, is focused on improving the health of every dog in America. Dog food might as well be considered dead food since it doesn't have a lot of nutrition to it. Nutrition's not brown, it's green. Let Rough Greens, sorry, Rough Greens, bring your dog's food back to life. Rough Greens is a supplement that contains all the necessary vitamins, minerals, probiotics, omega oils, digestive enzymes, and antioxidants that your dog needs. You don't even need to go out and get new dog food. Just sprinkle Rough Greens on their food every single time. Right now, you can get a free Jumpstart trial bag. Right now, your order, Jumpstart trial bag delivered straight to your door in just a few business days. Go to roughgreens.com slash Michael or call 844-ROUGH-123. That is R-U-F-F-Greens.com slash Michael or call 844-ROUGH, R-U-F-F-123 today. Speaking of civilization breaking down, Secret Service agents just had to fire on a criminal while they were protecting Naomi Biden. Naomi Biden is one of Joe Biden's grandkids. Secret Service is protecting Naomi Biden. I believe she was living at the White House for a while. She's an adult. I mean, she's not like a five-year-old, but she was, she was being driven around. This is in Washington, D.C., and they're out somewhere in Georgetown. Secret Service notices that a bunch of thugs are trying to bust into a Secret Service car. And they were so aggressive about it that the Secret Service actually had to end up opening fire on them. And this is the crazy part. The Secret Service didn't hit the guys, and they have, still haven't caught them, at least according to news reports. This, <laughs> this is a family member of the sitting president of the United States out in Georgetown, which is supposed to be the nicest neighborhood of Washington, D.C. It's supposed to be basically inaccessible by public transportation because they wanted to keep the riffraff out. Looks like the riffraff got in there and they're trying to carjack the Secret Service. And the secret, so much so that the Secret Service have to shoot at them and the Secret Service can't even hit them and they get away. What is happening to our country? What is happening to our civil order? And some people are going to hear this story and say, nah, there must be more to the story than that. Something doesn't seem right. I know for a fact this happened. The way I know for a fact this happened merely through the criminality of our political order, merely, merely through the, the breakdown of law and order that happened specifically in Washington, D.C., is one time I was in Washington, not that long ago, a few years ago, and I was out with a politician, prominent politician, and we were, out, we were out a little bit late, and he goes to his car, and then he comes back in, he says, someone broke into my car. This, th this was not a targeted hit. This was not someone trying to get state secrets or anything like that. 
It was just a smash and grab. And so, so we wait around for the cops, call the DC Metro cops. DC Metro cops show up. They say, hey, sorry, this is a, this is a common occurrence here. They say, hold on, you're telling me that a sitting prominent politician is, can get his bag stolen out of a car in, the, in a nice part of DC. We were not far from the White House. And it wasn't that, it was late. It wasn't like that late. And the cops say, yeah, there's nothing we can do. This happens so frequently in even the nice neighborhoods, maybe especially in the nice neighborhoods. So an ordinary citizen doesn't stand a chance. If it's going to happen to sitting politicians, to the granddaughter of the president of the United States in the nicest parts of town, it's happening to so many people. And, and it, it gets back to an element of our government that is, that is really lacking right now which is, yes, there are ideological fights. Yes, we differ over certain issues and we can get down to the fundamental philosophical differences in all of them. But shouldn't we all be able to agree that smash and grabs are bad? Shouldn't we? Isn't there a level of competence that, that ought to be required of our politicians to say, no, go arrest the burglars. Go arrest the carjackers. Isn't there? And we paper over that incompetence with ideological distinctions where you have someone like Rashida Tlaib who says, we need to abolish all prisons and let all the criminals off the hook and it's society's fault or whatever. But I think there's just a, there's just a basic incompetence here. You know, be, being mayor, being a, a prosecutor, being a chief of police, it's a job. And some people are good at their jobs and some people are bad at their jobs. They're, they're basic requirements of the job. And our politicians not only fall into all sorts of ideological confusion, they also just can't do their jobs. And when you have a breakdown in competence, your, your civil order is going to break down really, really quickly. Speaking of, speaking of politicians, Nikki Haley is in hot water right now because she has suggested a new form of social media reform uh, that would get rid of the anonymous accounts online. Take it away. When I get into office, the first thing we have to do, social media accounts, social media companies, they have to show America their algorithms. Let us see why they're pushing what they're pushing. The second thing is every person on social media should be verified by their name. That's, first of all, it's a national security threat. When you do that, all of a sudden, people have to stand by what they say, and it gets rid of the Russian bots, the Iranian bots, and the Chinese bots. And then you're going to get some civility when people know their name is next to what they say. Accountability. And they know their pastor and their family member is going to see it. It's going to help our kids, and it's going to help our country. So the first part is a good idea. The first part about making the tech companies show the algorithm so that we can make sure that they're not suppressing conservatives or... Uh, shadow banning conservatives. I think that's a great idea. But that that great idea is why the second idea is so confusing. Because if you're acknowledging that tech companies are pulling all sorts of shenanigans, especially against conservatives, then why would you want to de-anonymize those very same persecuted conservatives? I understand the argument in the abstract. Everyone's piling on Nikki right now and saying it's a terrible idea to force people to stand by their words. In principle, I don't think that's a terrible idea. I think that's actually a very good idea to hold people to certain standards and make them stand by their words. If the government were not persecuting normal people for being normal, that's the problem. That's the key here. The fact that we're acknowledging that the government and the private corporations doing the bidding of the government, but without the accountability, often at the direct behest of the government, as we saw uncovered in all those files from Facebook and Twitter, where the FBI and other government organizations are going in to the big tech companies and saying, hey, ban that guy. Hey, suppress that account. Hey, shut that conservative up. So if we know that, if we know that people are being persecuted by the government, not for committing crimes, not for being extremists, but for being normal, then but by de-anonymizing the people, you're, you're just making them sitting ducks for a predatory political order. There is a long-standing history of anonymous political discourse in America. It goes all the way back to the Federalist Papers. Publius was the, the pseudonym of Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay writing the Federalist defending the Constitution. Should we have de-anonymized them? Probably not a good idea. So, 
it's a problem with the Haley campaign because I think she some of the criticism of her is undeserved here. There, there would be something good about making people stand up for what they believe in and holding people accountable for their words if, if it were 20 years ago. If, if the government were not going into Catholic churches and spying on the supposedly dangerous extremist traditionalist Catholics going to Mass, if the government were not arresting pro-life activists just for standing and peacefully protesting outside of abortion clinics, infanticide mills, if, if the DOJ were not comparing parents who don't want their kids to be taught weird sex stuff in school to terrorists, if we weren't living in that world, yeah, okay, we don't, we don't need anonymous accounts. But in that world, we certainly do. In that world, this, the, look, some of the greatest accounts on all of social media are pseudonymous accounts. I, I retweet many of them frequently. Speaking of presidential candidates, then there were five. What right now we still have roughly, I guess there are some who don't make the debates but are still technically running, but right now we have six presidential candidates. We've got DeSantis, Christie, Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, and Trump, who is polling outpolling all of them by like 45 points. But it, uh, for the ones who show up to the debate, it's, there's the five of them. Well, now another one bites the dust. Tim Scott's got a big announcement to make. One of the things I would recommend to every single American, I know it's not possible, by the way, if you ever want to love your country more, run for president. Traveling this country, meeting people has been one of the most fantastic experiences of my entire life. I love America more today than I did on May 22nd. But when I go back to Iowa, it will not be as a presidential uh, candidate. I am suspending my campaign. I I think the voters uh, who are the most remarkable people on the planet have been really clear that they're telling me uh, not now, Tim. I don't think they're saying, Trey, no, but I do think they're saying not now. And so I'm going to respect the voters and I'm going to hold on and keep working really hard and uh, look forward to another opportunity. This is really mature. It's funny as Trey Gowdy there, former Congressman Trey Gowdy, who's now on Fox News, he, he tries to push Scott and he says, no, come on, what are you talking about? You're from South Carolina. We're coming up on the South Carolina race. You're crazy. Why would you drop out now? And Tim Scott says, yeah, because I'm not going to win. <laughs> Tim Scott, I don't think this is some Machiavellian kind of maneuver where he's making backroom deals even or calculations. Maybe he cut a deal with the Trump campaign, but I don't know that he did that. I think he's a pretty normal guy, Tim Scott. And I think he's just looking at the numbers. He's saying, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere at this race. People seem to like me. I, I'm not like Chris Christie. It's not that people hate me and never want me to run for president again. They like me. They just, it's not going to be me. It's going to be Trump. And then if something crazy happens and his 45-point lead goes away, it's going to be either DeSantis or Haley, but it's just not going to be me. And so I'm not going to waste the voters' time. I'm not going to waste their money. I'm not going to degrade myself by sticking in this race for no reason. And I'm going to live to fight another day. I'm a young man, and it's okay. I'm going to keep fighting. Tim Scott ran a a smart runner-up campaign in that he he didn't destroy his future political prospects in a way that DeSantis, by going up against Donald Trump so directly, may have seriously hampered his future political prospects. Nikki Haley, by supporting Trump and then opposing Trump and then supporting Trump again, saying, I'm not going to run for president if Trump runs, and then running against Trump, she's she's probably hurt her future political prospects. I'm not saying it's totally dead for either of them, but if they lose this race, I don't know that they're going to come out better for it. Tim Scott, I think, probably will. It's very, very normal, very much the right thing to do. And so now, Chris Christie is just salivating. He's saying, oh, finally, here we go, baby. The fact that Chris Christie is down to the final five is so outrageous. There were sitting governors, fairly popular senators in there. And somehow, Chris Christie, listen, maybe the Chris Assange is not totally dead. Hmm? Now, speaking of Mr. Trump, you know, the number one guy in the Republican race. Democrats, 
They're, I think they're beginning to realize he is probably the nominee, so they've got to train their sights on him. They've got, they've got to pull out the big guns now, okay? They, they've got a new strategy. Well, no, they've got a, no, it's the same strategy they were doing yesterday. It's the same strategy they've been doing for seven or eight years. Adam Schiff saying that Trump is like Hitler. I also want to ask you about some of Donald Trump's increasingly authoritarian rhetoric, because it's just so important to keep talking about this. I mean, he is echoing language used by Hitler um, and Mussolini. His campaign seems to be doubling down on that. To even contemplate uh, electing someone who will cling to power the way Donald Trump t- tried, who embraces the mm-hmm. language of dictators, uh, tries to dehumanize the opposition, calling them vermin, just like Hitler and Mussolini. Um, you know, when someone like that tells you what they're going to do, and he's telling us he's going to weaponize the Justice Department and won't leave power again, and not without uh, even more of a fight, you need to listen to them, and you certainly can't put them anywhere near the levers of power again. You need to listen to them because he is Hitler. Because he is Hitler. Did you hear me? He's super Hitler. Why didn't this work in 2016? I said, uh, wait, I'll try to say, <clears throat> he is Hitler. Hitler. Yeah, we heard you, buddy. We heard you. Trump is Hitler and Bush was Hitler. And the other Bush, I don't know if they called the other Bush Hitler. He was so nice, you know, but he didn't pose a real threat to them and he lost his reelection bid. But Reagan was certainly Hitler. And Barry Goldwater was Hitler, and Nixon was Hitler, and they're all they're all Hitler. Okay. No, but darn, guys, it's not working. I said, is Mussolini? No, Mussolini's less scary than Hitler. Okay. Uh, well, if we elect him, he won't leave power if he loses. Yeah, but he he will though. Because he did. He did last time. Even though you guys rigged the election and like a lot of people knew it. And it was pretty obvious because the pipes were bursting and changed all the election laws illegally in some cases and to benefit you. And even even then, he did leave power on time. He didn't even have a late checkout. So, yeah. So he's not he's not going to ship anyone off on the boxcars. He's not going to invade Czechoslovakia. He's not going to cling to power and and refuse to leave. We know all of that. Even if you're stupid, fear mongering, were plausible. We know he won't do that because, and this is, I think, the real advantage Trump has in this weird sort of re-election campaign. He was already president. And we saw what happened when he was president. We saw how he left office. We saw how terrible the country got after he was president because Joe Biden ruined all the good stuff he had done. I think these arguments by the Democrats sometimes work. I just don't think they work after the guy served a term, left office, and decided to run again. That's, I think, a little window into the Democrat strategy. And when you are thinking about the windows into your house, you've got to check out Renewal by Anderson. Right now, text Knowles to 200-300. For most homeowners, window replacement is not something they've done before. For many others, it is not something they want to do. It's something they have to do. Have you put off replacing the windows in your home because it's too expensive? Well, I've got great news. You can now get a free in-home window consultation and a free quote from Renewal by Anderson. Renewal by Anderson's signature service is committed to giving you the best customer experience possible, supported by the best people in the industry. In fact, I know this because one of my cousins works for Renewal by Anderson and has actually for years before they came on the show as an advertiser. I then got an email from a carpenter, totally unsolicited, who said, Michael, I heard you talk about Renewal by Anderson. They are absolutely the greatest. When I work on a home, I can tell right away when Renewal by Anderson has done the windows because they are top quality. They're offering a free in-home or virtual consultation on durable, quality, affordable windows or patio doors for $0, down zero payment, zero interest for a year. Text Knowles to 200-300 for your free consultation. Save 375 bucks off every window, 750 bucks off every door. These savings will not last long. Be sure to check it out. Text Knowles to 200-300. That is Knowles to 200-300. Texting privacy policy and terms and conditions posted at textplan.us. Texting rules for recurring automated text marketing messages. Message and data rates may apply. Reply stop to opt out. Go to windowappointmentnow.com for full offer details. Black Friday is coming and the Daily Wire has the best deals around. Starting Monday, get 50%, 50% off a Daily Wire Plus membership and all kinds of amazing deals on Jeremy's Razors products and tons of merch from our Daily Wire shop. There is something for everyone. Go to dailywire.com slash Black Friday and get the full guide to all of our Black Friday deals. Do not forget to tune in all next week. Find out more. Remember, these deals start on Monday, run through Cyber Monday, but 
We will sell out fast. Do not wait. Get the guide and start checking off your holiday shopping list. One more time, dailywire.com slash Black Friday for the best deals of the year. My favorite comment yesterday is from Dominic Zelenak, who says, impressive, very nice. Now let's see Paul Allen, San Francisco, says Gavin Newsom. Yes, that's so true. So true. Governor Bateman, we'll get to that. Governor Bateman has turned San Francisco into Beijing, which was an improvement over it was what it was before. Before it was like some gutter, you know, in in the back alleys of Honduras or something. And so it's gotten a little bit better now. Now it's just a replica of Beijing. We'll, we will get to that probably tomorrow. First, though, on this point of the hollow attacks on Trump, why I think Trump is actually stronger in 2024 than he was in 2020, is because it's for, it's for one of the reasons that some people consider Trump weaker. But I think it's actually an advantage for a a wild, eccentric candidate like Trump, which is, in a way, he's kind of yesterday's news. Here is typical liberal interview, liberal interviewer, Hollywood star being interviewed, Barbara Streisand saying, if Trump is elected, she can't live in the country. You've known of, you've known and supported a lot of political figures. You're friends with the Clintons. Yeah. I'm not going to get into you dating Pierre Trudeau, but you have uh, politicians in more than one country, shall we say. What do you make of the political climate of the United States now? Bad. Well, I like Biden. Mm-hmm. I like Biden. I think he's done a good job. I think he's compassionate. He's smart. He supports the right things. How do you feel about the specter of a second Trump administration? I will move. I can't live in this country if that's, if he became president. But where would you go? Where would you go? If Probably to England. Mm-hmm. I like England. <laughs> England is very nice. But she's serious. She's not telling a joke here. I would move. I would move if Trump became president. I couldn't live in this country if Trump became president. Except you did. Well, that's true. I did. Yeah, you lived here for four years when Trump was president. Oh, yeah, okay, that's true. I did. I, I did. And it was fine, right? You're totally fine. You're okay. You're alive. You're, you, th- you probably made even more money than you previously had and everything was fine. Well, yeah, but I couldn't do it again. <laughs> this is why I think the, the real act, especially with this intermediate period uh, where Biden has been president, <laughs> where everything's gone to pot, I think it puts Trump in a stronger position because it, it defangs the, the attacks. What are the attacks on Trump that work now? He's Hitler and he's going to kill everyone. Well, he didn't do that. He's going to start World War III. Actually, no, Biden's starting World War III. Don- Donald Trump was the best foreign policy president of my lifetime. He was the most, most peaceful president I- I've ever seen in my whole life. Uh, well, tr- well, okay, Trump's fine when he's president, but he won't leave office. Yeah, he did though. And he didn't want to, and you rigged the election, but he left anyway. Well, we just, it will, the country will be unlivable for the liberal elites. The liberal elites were fine. You all threatened to leave, and then he got elected, and you stayed, and you were fine. And now you're just doing this. It's just so exhausting. It's so silly, because it's just the same, you're like robots. You know, it's the same nonsense over and over again. But it, this time, you look even more ridiculous, because you're, you've either proven yourselves to be hypocrites, you've proven yourselves to be unserious, or you've proven your warnings to be specious and and ridiculous. Which is why, by the way, you are now seeing the field winnow in the race, and you're seeing the endorsements begin to coalesce around Trump. Whether you like Trump, whether you hate Trump, there's a reason why in Florida, a number of people who previously endorsed DeSantis are now endorsing Trump. Certain people are, are who had been on the fence are still endorsing people like DeSantis, potentially like Haley. I'm thinking of Kim Reynolds. That was a big one in Iowa, the the governor of Iowa. But generally, the movement seems to be for endorsements into the Trump camp. Because even if the people endorsing Trump right now don't even like Trump that much, even if they had previously endorsed Ron DeSantis and they they ran against Trump, they realize that it just looks like the guy is going to be the nominee and they're going to get on the winning team. This is including the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. As far as I know, you have not endorsed the former president yet uh, for 2024. And this is 
Everybody's watching this show right now. This, if you're going to do that, this would be a great, great time to do it, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. You ready? I, ha I have done it. it yeah, I, I have. I have endorsed him wholeheartedly. Um, look, I was uh, one of the closest allies that President Trump had in Congress. He had a phenomenal first term. Those first two years, as you all know, we brought about the greatest economic numbers in the history of the world, not just the country, because his policies worked. And I'm, I'm all in for President Trump. I, okay, yeah, I, know, I right. expect he'll be our nominee. Yeah. And, and he's going to win it. And we have to make Biden a one term president. We have to do that. Now, I don't mean to insinuate here that Mike Johnson is only endorsing Trump because the writing is on the wall. I don't think that's the case. I think he was a Trump supporter before, and I, I, there's no reason to believe he's not totally sincere and earnest here. But that's a big endorsement. He didn't have to endorse this early. Speaker of the House is a big endorsement. And there are a lot of other people who are endorsing, I think, in a less sincere way, but simply because they see that the writing is on the wall. And in part, this is because Trump made a bet. The bet was, I think the nomination's locked up. I'm not even going to show up to the debates. That could have backfired on him, and the voters could have said, hey, man, you, you're disrespecting us. We want you to come make your case. You need to earn our vote. That's what Haley and DeSantis and the other Republicans argued, and it just doesn't seem to have worked. So with the writing on the wall, you can expect more endorsements, and you can expect a more concerted strategy from the Democrats to call Trump Hitler even more loudly and with even more of a serious face on it. And you can expect more celebrities to threaten to leave the country. And you can expect more uh, liberals to sacrifice their children and their property to nature gods. And you, you can just expect more of the same that we've seen for years and frankly, even millennia. The rest of the show continues now. You don't want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, Canada, B -U -L -E -S. Check out for two months free on all annual plans.